the topic of today's lecture is going to be electron spin and the concept of the Pauli antisymmetry principle. We're going to pick up from where we left off last time, uh, but we're going to start with the, the fundamental concept of the intrinsic angular momentum of particles such as electrons, and that's an angular momentum that we call spin. So let's write that down. An intrinsic angular momentum of particles such as electrons spin. And the first thing I should say is that electrons are not the only particles that have spin, of course. Many other types of particles, different types of nuclides, also have spin. Protons, for example, many other types of nuclei, such as carbon-13 nuclei, fluorine-19, phosphorus-31, many others uh, have spin as well, but we're going to focus primarily today on the spin of the electrons. Now, I said here that spin is an angular momentum, and we've already encountered angular momentum in one context, and that's the context of the rigid rotor and also in the hydrogen atom. And if you remember when we discussed the hydrogen atom, we talked about two angular momentum quantum numbers. So in hydrogenic atoms, we had orbital angular momentum. And we use the quantum number L to describe that. And the allowed values of L, of course, were from 0 up to the principal quantum number n minus 1. I'm not concerned about the principal quantum number right now, just the orbital angular momentum quantum number L. But that wasn't the only angular momentum quantum number. We also had the z component of angular momentum. This is the projection of the angular momentum vector onto the z axis. We use the symbol m sub L for the z component of orbital angular momentum. M sub L. And the allowed values of M sub L were constrained by whatever the current value of L is. And so we could say that M sub L has a maximum value of plus L, and then goes in integer steps down to a minimum value of minus L. So for example, if angular momentum quantum number L had a value of 2, then in the maximum value of M sub L is plus 2, and then we also have 2, 1, 0, minus 1, and minus 2 for a total of five possibilities for M sub L. And again, that was the orbital angular momentum. Spin is completely analogous to the orbital angular momentum uh, in the sense that we also have, for a single electron, two quantum numbers. So. For a single electron, we have the spin angular momentum quantum number S. And S, for a case of a single electron, can only take on one possible value, and this is inherent to the electron. The only allowed value of S is one half. But, just as we have an orbital angular momentum, we also have a z component of spin angular momentum. z component of spin angular momentum. And what do you know? We use the symbol m sub s. Totally analogous to m sub l. And just like m sub l, where we had allowed values limited by l running from positive L to minus L and integer steps in between, M sub S works exactly the same way. So the maximum allowed value of M sub L, excuse me, M sub S is plus one half, but if I take integer steps down to the minimum value of negative S, well there's only one other possibility, and that's minus one half. We give these two values of M sub S, and again this is for a single electron, we give these two values special names. The plus one-half m sub s value we call alpha, right? and the minus one-half we give the symbol beta. Uh, 
and then we introduce spin into the wave function as through these alpha and beta, what we will call spin functions. And as I start to write down the, uh, representative wave functions, I'll demonstrate how these work. But let's go to the first quantum mechanical system for which we really need to discuss spin when we construct our wave functions, and that is the helium atom. So, as mentioned in class before, the helium atom is the first quantum mechanical system for which we cannot solve the Schrodinger equation exactly. And to make sure that we're clear on what that means, the first quantum mechanical system for which I cannot write down analytic expressions for either the energy or the wave functions, right? Either the eigenvalue energy or the eigenfunctions, the wave functions. Unlike the hydrogen atom, where I had explicit expressions for the wave functions and energy, or the two or three D, three D rigid rotors, or the harmonic oscillator, or the particle in a box in one, two, or multiple dimensions. We can't do it for the helium atom. Now let's write down the helium atom Schrodinger equation and see if we can understand why that is. So I'll move back over to the left-hand side of the board. And every time we deal with a new quantum mechanical problem, we always have to write down the Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian for a helium atom is going to consist of one term for kinetic energy for each of the particles involved, and then all of the potential energies. And the potential energies in the helium atom case are strictly Coulombic attractions and repulsions. So I'm going to take my nucleus for my helium atom to be at the origin, and I'm going to have my two electrons moving around that origin. So I have to have a kinetic energy term for each of those two electrons, and those are going to look like they always do, minus h bar squared over two times the mass of an electron times the second derivative with respect to all of the coordinates of the first electron. And we'll summarize all of those using the Laplacian that we've seen before, this del squared. And I've given it a subscript 1 to explicitly indicate that these are only second derivatives with respect to the coordinates of electron 1. I have a second electron, so I have another term that looks just like this, minus h bar squared over 2 m sub e times del squared. But now that one gets a subscript 2 because it only deals with the coordinates of electron 2. So those are my two kinetic energy terms, and I'm assuming that I have my helium nucleus fixed at the nucle at the at the origin. So it's clamped at the at the origin, excuse me. But now I have potential energy terms, and if you remember, in a, in a hydrogen or hydrogenic atom, we had one potential energy function or operator that described the Coulombic attraction between my negatively charged electron and my positively charged nucleus, a proton in the case of a hydrogen atom. Now I have a term just like that except a term for each of those electrons because electron 1 is attracted to the nucleus and separately electron 2 is attracted to the nucleus. So I'll write down those two comparable potential energy terms. So I get minus ze squared over 4 pi epsilon naught, the permittivity of free space, times the distance of electron 1 from the nucleus, which we'll just call R1. And that makes sense. In spherical polar coordinates, R1 would just be the, the length of the radius vector for that electron 1 away from the origin where our nucleus is. And then I have another term just like this for electron 2. So I have minus ze squared over 4 pi epsilon naught times R2, the distance of electron 2 from the, the nucleus, which is at the origin. But I'm not done. Of course, both electrons, they are negatively charged. And because of that, they repel each other. So there's an additional Coulombic term describing the repulsion between these two electrons. And in that case, it's simply e squared. z here only refers to the atomic number of the nucleus, and that's not involved in this term. So positive e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught times r12, which would be the distance between electron 1 and electron 2. And there's my final Coulombic term. The 4 pi epsilon naught, the permittivity of free space, occurs in all three of these terms, basically to ensure that we get correct units of joules. This expression is entirely in SI units. All five terms are in joules as written. I could also write this in atomic units, which we discussed in class. And then, so in atomic units, the advantage becomes clear 
in that most of these constants become one, by definition, in atomic units. All of the physical constants simply disappear. H bar becomes one, the mass of the electron becomes one, the permittivity of free space becomes one, and the fundamental unit of charge E becomes one. With that in mind, I simply get minus one half del one squared minus one half del two squared minus z over r1 minus z over r2 plus one over r12. Much simpler. So there's the structure of the Hamiltonian first in SI units and then in atomic units, just to show you uh, the different structure. Now, every Schrodinger equation that we have dealt with up to this point has been solvable analytically. We could write down analytic solutions for both the wave function and the energy because all of them have been separable in whatever coordinate system we've dealt with. Remember what I mean by separable. Separable means that the Hamiltonian itself, right, like this, the Hamiltonian itself can be written as a sum of separate terms, each involving a single coordinate. That's what we mean by separable. If the Hamiltonian can be written as a sum of individual terms, each involving a separate independent variable or independent coordinate, then the solution to the Schrodinger equation, the wave function, can be written exactly as a product of functions each in each of those coordinates. So for example, for the hydrogen atom, where I only had to deal with the coordinates of my electron, I had r, theta, and phi in spherical polar coordinates. The Hamiltonian could be separated as a sum of terms, one involving r, one involving theta, one involving phi, and therefore the wave function describing the, the electron in a hydrogen atom could be written exactly as a product one involve, of, of terms, one function involving r, another function involving theta, and another function involving phi. That separability is what allowed us to, to do that. Now if you look at this Hamiltonian here, and I'll just point to the one in atomic units because it's a bit simpler, you can see that if I look at the first and third terms, I've got the kinetic energy of electron one and the electron nuclear attraction for electron one. Those two terms together are exactly the same as a hydrogen atom Hamiltonian. Similarly, terms two and four, if I just denote them, those are also identical to hydrogen atom Hamiltonian. So it looks like if I take the first and third term plus the second and fourth term, I have a sum of two hydrogen atom Hamiltonians. But what complicates this problem is the last term, which involves both the coordinate of electron one and the coordinate of electron two in order to get the distance between the two electrons. It's that term, that electron-electron repulsion term here, that couples our two sets of coordinates. And it's that term that prevents us from writing the Hamiltonian in a separable form. And because we can't write the Hamiltonian in a separable form, I cannot write the, write the wave function as a product of terms. I can't write it exactly as a product of terms, one involving electron one and one involving electron two. And therefore, the helium atom Schrodinger equation corresponding to this uh, Hamiltonian is not exactly solvable. Therefore, we have to resort to approximations. And the first approximation, really the simplest approximation, it, it, we can get an idea of it because if I ignore this term, the 1 over R12 coupling term, the fact that I do have a sum of a hydrogen atom Hamiltonian for electron 1 and a hydrogen atom Hamiltonian for electron 2, that suggests that maybe a good approximation is what we call the orbital approximation. And the idea is really simple. The idea is that I write my wave function that involves the coordinates of both electrons as a simple product of two functions, one involving only the coordinates of electron one and the other involving the coordinates of electron two. So for a helium atom, for a helium atom in which I have two electrons in a 1s type orbital, and this notation, by the way, actually comes from the orbital approximation. I'm simply going to take those two functions that I'm guessing are useful here for this approximate wave function as hydrogen-like wave functions, such as 1s functions. So I'll write my two-electron total wave function. I'll use a capital psi and explicitly give all the coordinates for electron 1. That's what I mean by vector r1 and all the coordinates of electron 2, that's what I mean by vector r2, and I'll write it as a product 
And I'll use lowercase psi for the individual orbitals. Psi sub 1s is a 1s-like hydrogen atom orbital that you already know the functional form for, times, excuse me, as a function of the coordinates of electron 1, times another 1s-type orbital, but this one's a function of the coordinates of electron 2. Now the first thing to note is, even though this is a relatively simple function, it's six-dimensional, right, but it's a product of two three-dimensional functions, the first thing to note is, I haven't said anything about spin. And that's what's missing. Now we arrive at the point when we consider this two-electron wave function in the orbital approximation, and the fact that spin exists in alpha or beta forms for a single electron, now we are ready to introduce the last of the quantum mechanical postulates. And we're going to take this to be postulate six using the numbering system for one through five that I had in class. Now this is our sixth quantum mechanical postulate, and this one is called the Pauli principle. Pauli principle. All electronic wave functions, so here we go, all electronic wave functions must be anti-symmetric with respect to permutation of the coordinates of any two electrons. Antisymmetric, all that means is that if I take a wave function describing more than one electron, and I take any two of the electrons that that wave function describes, and I simply invert, I reverse their coordinates, the wave function has to change sign. It becomes the negative of itself. So in the case of a helium atom, for example, where I have only two electrons, if I reverse the coordinates to give a new function where it's R2 and then R1, that function must be the negative of the function that I started with. That, in essence, is the Pauli anti-symmetry principle. Now, you've probably heard from general chemistry the Pauli exclusion principle. That actually is a result of the Pauli anti-symmetry principle, principle six. I should also say that this principle applies to more than just electrons. It applies to any type of particle with what we call half-integer spin. I told you before that the spin angular momentum quantum number s for a single electron has a value of one half. Any particle, electron or nuclide, that has a spin that's half integer, one half, three halves, five halves, etc., all of them obey a Pauli principle, anti-symmetry principle like this. So, does this structure to the wave function match our orbital approximation? I think you can very quickly see that if I simply take R1 and R2, those two vectors in this expression, and I swap them, I don't get the negative of what I started with. In fact, I get exactly the same wave function. So, this form does not obey Pauli. Pauli is Wolfgang Pauli, the, uh, the, the German physicist who explored spin uh, initially. So what do we do? We need to construct instead another wave function that takes into account spin. This one also does not have any explicit reference to spin. And figure out how to construct one similar to it, similar to this, that obeys this principle. Well, one thing that I could do is, is take the sort of schematic expression that you've all seen before in which I explicitly have some line that represents an energy level associated with an orbital, in this case a 1s type orbital. And you've all seen the structure before where we put in two arrows, each one representing an electron. The arrow up is supposed to represent an alpha spin electron, an electron, and the arrow down is the beta spin electron, like we described before. And remember, arrow up, alpha spin, means m sub s equals plus 1 half, 
arrow down, the beta spin means m sub s equals minus 1 half. So I could just instead take this structure and throw on spin. Now if I do that, let's include spin. Right? I'm using this notation here with the two arrows, one up, one down, as sort of a guide to inserting spin associated with the electrons. So let's do that. I could write then psi r1, r2, both vectors. I'll take, since these are both in a, in a, a 1s type spatial orbital, well, there's electron 1 in a 1s, but I'm going to give it an alpha spin. Okay? So there's alpha spin, but I've got to indicate that that spin function goes with electron 1, so I'll give it a subscript 1. But then the beta spin electron, my electron 2, I'm going to give it beta spin in, in a psi 1s orbital. So psi 1s r2, it's beta spin, and I have to give it subscript 2 to indicate that's associated with electron 2. Well, this is better than the, what I wrote down to begin with in that at least I have spin identified. However, I still don't obey the Pauli principle. If you simply switch these subscripts, r1 and alpha1, with the subscripts r2 and beta2 here, I don't even get the same wave function anymore, right? Because, because then I would have psi 1s r2 alpha2 times psi 1s r1 beta, excuse me, beta1. Again, I've switched the coordinates of electrons 1 and 2, both spin and spatial parts, to get this, right? So we've switched electrons 1 and 2. But now this is a different wave function entirely. I still don't obey the Pauli principle. So this isn't, this isn't any good. How do I construct a wave function that does obey the Pauli principle? It's very simple. I'll take the first function that I described, which I extracted just from this notation, and I'm going to subtract from it the second function that I created, where I swapped electrons 1 and 2. So what do I get? Psi r1, r2. I'm going to leave a little room after the equal sign because I'm going to add something in a moment. I'm going to take the first function, psi 1s r1 alpha 1 times psi 1s r2 times beta 2, and I'm going to subtract from it the second function, psi 1s r2 alpha 2 times psi 1s r1 beta 1. And I'm going to close the brackets. Now, since I took a linear combination of two functions to do this, I need to make sure that the resulting total wave function is still normalized. And as you've seen a couple of times in class, when I'm only dealing with two type functions, especially one that is considers, consistent of normalized components in the wave function, then I can simply add a 1 over root 2 up front. That new wave function is normalized, and if you look really, really carefully, you'll see that this is, in fact, obeying the Pauli anti-symmetry principle postulate 6. Just to make it explicit, let's write down the same wave function, capital Psi, but now I'm going to reverse the coordinates of electrons 1 and 2. I'm going to make Psi R2, R1. Well, the 1 over R excuse me, 1 over root 2 part is exactly the same. And I leave the structure of all the functions in place, but now I take 1s r2 alpha 2 psi 1s r1 beta 1, that's the first term. You see I've just swapped the 1s and 2s associated with the r coordinate and the alpha or beta, minus psi 1s r1 alpha 1 psi 1s r2 beta 2. This function, which I've just swapped the two electrons, their coordinates, now is exactly the same as the function I started with, except the second term in the expression is here, and the first term is here. And you'll notice that because the signs are different, this is exactly equal to minus psi r1 r2 which means we obey the Pauli anti-symmetry principle, which is what we were looking for.
Now, this seems kind of a complicated notation, but there's a simpler notation that we can use. We can also see how the Pauli uh, anti-symmetry principle leads us to the more familiar Pauli exclusion principle, starting from exactly the same way we did before. Let's start with the helium atom with its two electrons. Now let's put both of the electrons into a 1s type orbital, but let's make them both alpha spin. Let's make them both spin up. So we'll take 1s, and using the same sort of schematic, I'll put two up arrows, both alpha spin electrons, for both electrons 1 and 2, into that function. Well, let's do the same thing. Let's take this structure of the wave function that we did for the alpha and beta spin electrons, but now let's plug them both in and make sure that we obey Pauli anti-symmetry. We do that by taking analog analogies to these two functions, right, where we take one structure but with an alpha spin here, minus the other structure, again, with an alpha spin here. So we'll take psi r1 r2, 1 over root 2, and an analogy to the first function here, I'll write down psi 1s r1 alpha 1. So that's alpha spin electron 1. Multiplied by psi 1s r2 alpha 2. Now clearly that half of it does not obey Pauli anti-symmetry, so I'll generate the second function here where I've reversed electrons 1 and 2, but I'll bring it in with a minus sign. That's what ensures the anti-symmetry. So 1s, psi 1s, r2, but again that's alpha 2, psi 1s, r1, alpha 1. So again, I put them both in with alpha spins, which is what I wanted to, to test. But look at these two functions, right? So, again, these are just multiplications, so I can reorder these all I want. But what you see is that this function, with the minus sign, has a psi 1s r1 alpha 1, just like here, and a psi 1s r2 alpha 2, just like here. So this function is actually identical to that function because I've used the same spin but they have opposite signs because I'm obeying Pauli anti-symmetry. But that is just zero. They cancel each other out exactly. That's the basis of the Pauli exclusion principle. When you build a wave function, approximate wave function like this, using orbitals, in which you put two electrons in the same orbital, in this case a 1s type hydrogen-like orbital, both with the same spin, then when you obey the Pauli anti-symmetry principle, postulate 6, you automatically generate a zero-wave function, which means it's not allowed. So that's the manifestation of the Pauli exclusion principle as a result of the Pauli anti-symmetry principle. Now this notation that we've developed here, yes, it obeys Pauli anti-symmetry, but it looks a little complicated. But it can be greatly simplified. In fact, we can use a special property of matrices to write a much more simplified form that's a little bit easier to remember and easier to keep up with, so bear with me. First, I'm going to get rid of these components so I have this whole side of the board to work with. And I'm going to write this wave function, this Pauli uh, anti-symmetry obeying alpha beta spin electron, uh, excuse me, wave function, in a, in a matrix form. To do that, I actually need to take the determinant of a matrix. And if you remember, the determinant of a matrix, uh, if it's a simple 2 by 2 matrix, involves the product of the diagonal terms minus the product of the anti-diagonal terms. So let's write that down uh, in a form that yields this wave function that we want. So I keep my normalization factor out front, and now I'm going to write a determinant using the, the usual absolute value like signs, but for a matrix. And in that matrix, I'm going to put psi 1s r1 times alpha 1. That's my upper left entry of a 2 by 2 matrix. And then I'm going to have psi 1s r1 beta 1. So my first function here is psi 1s with an alpha spin. My second function is psi 1s with a beta spin. But you'll notice on the first row of my matrix, I have only electron 1. And then I'll close off this. 
I still have to fill in the second row. The second row of the matrix, that's where I use exactly the same spatial and spin function, psi 1s and alpha then beta, but now I use electron 2. There's R2 for the spatial coordinate of electron 2, and now I give my alpha spin function a subscript 2. I do the same thing for the last entry, but that's beta spin. So again, the first row corresponds to electron 1, the second row corresponds to electron 2. The first column corresponds to my orbital 1, right, which is a psi 1s spatial part and an alpha spin function. That's the first column. The second column refers to my second orbital. That's a psi 1s spatial part and a beta spin function. So again, electron 1 and electron 2 on the rows uh, by 1s times alpha for the first column, 1s times beta for the second column. When I take the determinant of this matrix, that means taking the product of the two functions on the diagonal, that's exactly these two functions from the wave function we built, minus the product of the functions on the anti-diagonal, that results in the second term. So you can see that this expression is identical to this expression. We can make it even simpler, right? So you can simplify the notation. Let's take, let's take uh, uh, this kind of simpler notation. I'm going to take the expression 1s times alpha, and I'm going to make a subscript 1 on the alpha. This is defined to be psi 1s r1 alpha 1. That's a lot less to write down, but you can see how it's going to mean exactly the same thing. Uh, whereas 1s beta 2, for example, would be a psi 1s r2 vector times beta 2. When I write that down, then this expression becomes even simpler. I get 1s alpha 1. 1s beta 1, 1s alpha 2, 1s beta 2. It's a lot easier to keep up with. But again, don't forget this notation now, right? Whenever I draw uh, an orbital label next to a single line, meaning it's the same energy, and I put electrons in this way, that notation I mean to imply this. Now, why does this matrix determinant notation obey Pauli antisymmetry? Because it is a property of the determinant of, uh, property of determinants of matrices that when you switch any two rows, or for that matter, any two columns, I permute any two rows or two columns, the determinant changes sign. And that's not too hard to see in this case. If I were to swap row one with row two, notice that that's exactly the same as swapping the coordinates of electrons one and two. If you work out the determinant of that new matrix, you see it's exactly our second wave function, the, the one that's the negative of the first that we wrote down to begin with. Okay, so again, swapping any two rows of my determinant changes the sign, which is exactly what we mean by Pauli antisymmetry and the sixth postulate. Now, this is quite simple when I only have two electrons, and it's not too hard to expand it when I have three or more electrons. Don't forget that these are just approximate wave functions. I can't really write down the exact solution to the Schrodinger equation for any atom or molecule with two or more electrons. But this is a good approximation, and this is called a Slater determinant. After John C. Slater. What about expanding this, as I said? Let's expand this out to more electrons. Let's go with a lithium atom now. Lithium atom has three electrons, and when we normally write down the electron configuration of lithium in what we call the building up or Aufbau principle, we say it's got two electrons in a 1s type orbital and one electron in a 2s orbital. Okay, I'm trying to make my two a little bit better here. That's not so good. Now, if I draw the same kind of energy level schematic, then you might draw something like this. And it's completely arbitrary that I chose to put an alpha spin electron in the 2s. I could have chosen beta spin. doesn't make any difference. When you'll see, when I write down the Slater determinant corresponding to that configuration. 
Let's do it. Now this is a three electron system, right? This is a three electron system. So the first thing I have to do is recognize how to get the normalization factor right. So I've got now coordinates of three electrons in my total wave function. The normalization factor for two electrons was one over root two. In fact, the normalization factor is one over root two factorial. So when I have three electrons, it's actually one over root three factorial, so it's one over root six. But now, since I have three electrons, I now have three electrons and three orbitals, including spin. I now have a three by three matrix of which I have to take the determinant. So using the simplified notation that we did here, my first row is going to correspond to electron one, but each column is a different orbital. So upper left corner, I have a 1s alpha one, and then I have a 1s beta one, and then finally a 2s alpha one. So again, 1s alpha, 1s beta, 2s alpha. 1s alpha, 1s beta, 2s alpha. All of those are electron one because they're on the first row. Now I use exactly the same orbitals, but this time I simply attach electron two. 1s alpha two, 1s beta two, 2s alpha two. And the third row for the third electron, 1s alpha three, 1s beta three, 2s beta three. If you simply expand the determinant of this 3 by 3 matrix, you will get an, a wave function that obeys Pauli antisymmetry and involves those three spin functions, alpha, beta, and alpha. And I could keep on going with this. I could go to beryllium with its th four electrons. I could put another one here. If I want to deal with excited configurations, for example, of the helium atom, I could take a 1s uh, orbital with one electron in it and a 2s orbital with another electron in it. I could go to more complex atoms if I want to, like carbon and nitrogen and so on. But I have to deal with larger and larger matrices, right? Now, here's an interesting question. It's clear if I want to do the ground state of lithium, I've got a 1s2, 2s1. I said that this alpha spin electron, I could arbitrarily choose beta. That's true, and it won't make any significant difference. In this case, and I'm not going to demonstrate this, so I just ask you to trust me, the wave function that I've written here, in which I've got an alpha spin electron in the 2s orbital, versus its counterpart in which I have a beta spin electron in the 2s orbital, it turns out that those two wave functions have identical energies. Energy being defined as the expectation value of the Hamiltonian for a lithium atom using this wave function. There's no difference. But what about more complex atoms? Let's jump to carbon. If I think about the ground state of a carbon atom, carbon has six electrons total. Its ground state electronic configuration, which you learned a long time ago in general chemistry, is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. So similar to here, except I've got four electrons total in the 1s and 2s, so I'll, I'll draw those. 1s, two electrons, 2s, I'm not trying to get the schematic energy levels right, but now the 2p, it's higher in energy than the 2s in this many electron system, but how many orbitals are there in the 2p? If you recall, p corresponds to an orbital angular momentum quantum number of 1, which means the z component of orbital angular momentum quantum number m sub l can take on three possible values, 1, 0, and minus 1. Those are individual wave functions, separate spatial wave functions, so I have 1, 0, and minus 1, and I will label them as plus 1, 0, and minus 1 by their m sub l quantum numbers. Now I have two electrons to put into those three orbitals. And don't forget, each of those electrons can have either an alpha spin or a beta spin. That's a lot of possibilities. Each one of those possibilities I write down, just like here, corresponds to a determinant. But are all of those possibilities equivalent? What if I put, like you were probably taught, right, in general chemistry and high school chemistry, what if I fill them up like that, putting an alpha spin electron in the m sub l equals plus one, and an alpha spin electron in the m sub l equals zero? Well, why did I choose that, besides the fact that you were taught to do this a long time ago? Couldn't I have just equally said, well, let's do this. There's one, zero, and minus one. What if I did this? Let's put an alpha spin electron in the plus one, and now an alpha spin electron in the minus one. Does that make any difference? Or, I've got lots of other choices here. I could instead 
what if I put both of the electrons in the m sub l equals zero, but I pair them? Is this wave function preferable or more or less preferable than either of these wave functions? And again, don't forget, each of these structures that I draw corresponds to a Slater determinant, right? A determinant involving these different matrices, in this case, six by six matrices because I have six electrons. Which of these should I prefer? Are there any differences? Well, it turns out, yes, there are numerous differences among them. And I can write down uh, a total, well, I can write down, we'll get to how many wave functions, a large number of wave functions corresponding to all the possibilities of arranging my two electrons in those three m sub l orbitals, two p-type orbitals, with alpha and beta spins. Those wave functions do not all have the same energy. In fact, those wave functions come in groups, three different groups, with three different energies. And those wave functions can be rather complicated to write down, but it turns out that I don't have to write down all the wave functions to understand what the energy groupings are. There's a lot of degeneracy in these three groups of wave functions. What we're going to learn about next, starting from this point, is the concept of an atomic term symbol. An atomic term symbol is a single symbol, which really is a bookkeeping method for grouping atomic wave functions of the same energy together. It allows us to identify what those groups are, and there's even some very simple rules called Hund's rules, after Friedrich Hund, that allows us to guess, really guess quite accurately in many, many cases, what groups of wave functions, what term symbol corresponds to the lowest energy grouping. And we'll be talking about that next. Thank you.